I'm Dan Miller. I'm the retired congressman from here in the Sarasota Bradenton area. I served in Congress from 1992 until 2002. And since leaving Congress, I have been teaching. And one area I enjoy teaching is in the Lifelong Learning Program here at the University of South Florida. The Lifelong Learning is for retired people in our area. They offer a wide range of classes four times a year. There's 80 classes offered right now, matter of fact. Uh, my class is focused on politics this year on the budget and the fiscal cliff and such. Uh, and today I have a special guest, and that's the reason uh, we're very fortunate that METV is going to be covering this, and we're playing on METV, and it'll be available on YouTube. Uh, my guest is uh, Andy Ireland, my predecessor in Congress. Uh, Andy served in Congress from 1976 until 1992. And what I really want to focus on in the class today, in discussion with Andy, is how things you know, have changed a lot, but it hasn't changed. We see all this hyper-partisanship that's existing in Washington and all that, and we think nostalgically of the days of Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan, how everybody just got along well. Well, that hyper-partisanship existed back in the 70s and 80s. When Andy first got elected, he was a Democrat in 1976. This whole area was very Democrat as it was in the South. Uh, Andy is a graduate of Yale University and grew up in Cincinnati and moved here. But uh, it, uh, uh, he served eight years as a Democrat, and he was in the leadership because on the whip team. Uh, and then he switched in 1984 and became a uh, Republican. And then he served eight years as a Republican. So he gives a perspective of both a Democrat and a Republican. So the number of topics we're going to talk about, and then we're going to have some time for questions. But I thought we'd first start off ask Andy to kind of tell me how did you get into politics and why and what was it like in 1976 when you ran for office. Well, the short answer to that is I, I backed into it. I really, like uh, maybe many of you here, uh, uh, maybe got into some kind of organization or into politics itself, <clears throat> not as a lifelong, <clears throat> excuse me, plan, but as uh, just circumstances. Uh, I was in the banking business, <clears throat> had a couple of little uh, banks that I was running in, uh, in the Polk County area. Uh, got, got involved when uh, I got the Boston Red Sox, who Sarasota had run them off. They went out to Arizona. Nobody in New England, you know, went to Arizona. So they were coming back. It was the right place at the right time. Uh, engineered uh, uh, with a young man that was uh, two of us pretty young, a, a mayor, and, and got the Red Sox in there for 25 years to do that. Well, when they built the stadium, uh, uh, I had it all worked out. They came up short, and I had to pony up seventeen thousand dollars to put the scoreboard in. And I got, you know, kind of huffy about it. And so the next, uh, the next election, I ran for a city commission, and all of a sudden I was one. So that's that. That started it all. Uh, uh, the next thing is uh, uh, later on in my life, I was in the banking business still, and uh, I'd come to Florida in '54, so I'd been there a long time and traveled the state. And uh, uh, senator in my area uh, was indicted, had to leave the state senate. Uh, I uh, wasn't thinking anything about it, and uh, Reuben Askew, who was the governor, called me and said, "Hey, you got to run for that." Well, t 11 other guys ran for it. I thought I knew everything about politics by that time, of course, and I, I came in second. Well, you had a runoff, at, but the, the city of Lakeland, of all the little towns in Polk County, dominated the scene, and uh, my opponent was from Lakeland, and I ran, uh, and I, I lost. I lost, and I suddenly realized, well, you know, the people in Lakeland kept coming up to me. We understand this, but we, we would have voted for you, but. Uh, Lakeland owns this one seat. There were two senators in the same area, and Lakeland has to have one of those seats. That was there's nothing in the law or anything else. And I realized very quickly, light went on. There's a lot more to politics than than what's in the book. And shortly thereafter, Mr. Haley, who many of you knew, lived in Sarasota, who was in the the district that covered Polk County. Uh, Sarasota from Osprey North, the city, all of Manatee County, Hardy County, part of Osceola, part of Hillsborough County. He, he quit. He left six days before qualifying ended to, to decide whether you're going to run. Everybody said, 
not to worry. Again, as Dan says, it was an all-democratic era in this state. Whoever won the Democratic primary was going to be the congressman. Um, there was a, 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 a lawyer in town that, that had been the uh, uh, 18 years in the Florida State Legislature, and everybody said, well, he's, he's going to run. We all think he's conservative, very conservative, rural area, and he'll be the nominee. Why bother about it? I couldn't be, believe, uh, he's a perfectly nice guy, I couldn't believe he'd be my congressman. And so, again, you know, not thought through very well, I said, oh, I'm going to run. <laughs> I ran, there were six of us, and I won without a runoff. And all, all because I had, basically, I had learned my lesson, and, and uh, I, I, Polk County had most of the people the people of Lakeland, I made them feel real bad about not voting for me before. <laughs> and, and, and so all of a sudden, I, I was one. So uh, that's how I decided to run. Nothing scientific, but I think it's, uh, I don't mean to belittle it, but uh, it, I found very quickly, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I found that, uh, gosh, you know, I was in business, like many of you probably were, uh, running your business, I happen to be running banks, uh, that you get the best information you can and you make a decision and you check with lawyers and other people. And I found very quickly in the Congress that uh, most of them are lawyers and all they want to do is talk about it. And that, you know, frustration number one, you know. Uh, and I found that, uh, that all along the way, uh, enlightening things, but I was glad and I felt like I represented a lot of what America is about citizen legislation, and I certainly was, beat all the definition of a citizen legislator. Uh, I hadn't started out, nothing wrong with doing it that way, but there were a, a very large number of my fellow congressmen that decided, you know, when they were in high school that they were going to co college and law school and, and run for the city commission and, and work their way up. Nothing wrong with it, but I felt that because of this, you know, way that I got into it, that at least I brought a different perspective. So that's how I got well, there, Dan. Well, that's interesting. That's a, I, uh, <clears throat> we had dinner last night uh, preparing for today, but comment about Jim Haley. Uh, Jim Haley was your predecessor for like 30 years and represented the Sarasota area. He was actually from Sarasota. The congressional district back then included Polk County, which is Lakeland, which is a much larger county than Manatee or Sarasota counties and usually dominated the politics. But Jim Haley was the congressman for many years here and he supported you and he gave you a big contribution check. He did. I mean, uh, of course, I was, again, from the middle of this district. Mr. Haley <clears throat> had been there 34 years. Um, and when he started the district, of course, it, a number of changes in redistricting, <clears throat> when he started, it actually went to the to the east coast of Florida. So it was, he had begun probably in the middle of his district, but it, it had gotten smaller and smaller, and of course, the middle of the state was then wagging the dog. Uh, but Mr. Haley, who was married to one of the Ringling's uh, descendants, uh, was uh, a very, he was one of the first guys to uh, uh, propose a balanced budget amendment. Uh, and and uh, Never traveled much back to the district because he, he didn't fly, trains took a long time, and he had, most of his career, the Congress stopped in July and didn't go the rest of the year. So, whole different era that he came from, and <clears throat> Dan's right, he I obviously had to work hard down in this area, having been from the center of the state to about votes, and uh, my chairman of my committee down here had, was fixated on the fact that if Mr. Haley was very tight with his funds and that if I could get a contribution from Mr. Haley, that that would have a very large impact on the, on the primary race. And sure enough, about you know, uh, three or four weeks before the end of the campaign, uh, he was able to get Mr. Haley to give me a check which I carried around from then on, and, and of course my campaign manager made a big deal out of it where he had a 
but it was for $25. <laughs> <laughs> but I was the only one that had it. <clears throat> he, said he, he said he wouldn't endorse anybody, but, he, but it was easy to say, well, he gave Andy a check and he didn't give anybody else. But wonderful guy, wonderful guy. There's an interesting story. He was married to the Ringlings and, and worked for the circus. And he ended up, and there was a story in the Sarasota paper a year or so ago about it, but uh, he ended up going to uh, jail uh, because of the circus fire in Connecticut back in the yeah. 30s or something, or early 40s. And he was comptroller of the... Right. And he, he had absolutely, there's no way of, I mean, apparently among lawyers, and some of you may be out here and know what it is, it's a, it's a part of a landmark thing in, in general law that that he, he, somebody from the corporation was going to have to go to jail as a result of this. He had, had, wasn't even in the state of Connecticut. I mean, he was nowhere around. And the family decided he should do it. He went to jail. <laughs> he got out and, and got his, his, all his uh, rights reserved. A funny thing, when, when I left the Congress, I, I called, uh, I, I was going to make up my mind. I thought I, the least I could do is tell my close supporters that uh, that what I what I was going to do, and and actually uh, what I was going to do is go be vice president of Ringling Brothers, senior vice president of Ringling Brothers, in charge of a bunch of stuff. So I called up a good friend of Dan's, uh, uh, Dan Blaylock, who among the people I called in, in in Bradenton, and I said, Dan, I want to tell you that I'm I'm going to announced pretty soon that I'm going to leave the Congress and uh, he said what are you going to do and I said well I'm going to be senior vice president of Ringling I'm pretty excited about doing this and um, I said isn't it funny that Mr. Haley went from the circus to the Congress and you're going from Congress to the circus and uh, I said yes he, he said, are you going to jail too? <laughs> <laughs> so at any rate, it was an uh, yeah, uh, interesting way to exit. How, you've read the paper how the Ringling Brothers Circus is moving their whole facilities, headquarters to Ellington at the, the big Siemens plant up there. And, and it's essentially a family-owned corporation. The, the Fell family owns it. And so uh, uh, Andy, of course, worked for them. But he also got to know and work with the father, who really is the one that first acquired the circus and right. the family, and he served on your bank board in Lake in Winter Haven right. before you even went to Congress. And one of the events that Andy did as a fundraiser, you had to raise money, is Mr. Feld was always supportive. They'd have a circus when the circus is in Washington, he would have a fundraiser at the circus. And so, right. describe that for a minute. Well, and this this gets into what I'm sure we'll talk about later on is what it my my 16 years was uh, uh, an unusual kind of a time. Well, uh, so was Dan's, 10 years. But uh, when, the, when I was there, just as a throwback, the members of Congress didn't go out and raise money during the first year of, of, a, of a session. I mean, just nobody thought about doing it. <clears throat> that all changed while I was there. But uh, the... Uh, what what transpired was when I ran for office, the owner of the circus called me and said, "What are you, <clears throat> you know, what are you uh, uh, doing?" I said, "I'm going to run for Congress." He said, "I heard that." He said, "Can I help?" And I said, "Dan, if I know, I've not done this before." He said, "I'll take care of some signs." And so he put signs up, four right side up, one upside down, kind of hokey, you know, except for the fact he said to the media and in places that un were interested that this was an old circus tradition going back hundreds and hundreds of years in England and in Europe uh, to get attention. Well, it got it all right. My signs could have said nothing, but it got a lot more publicity than the average person that puts out signs. All kinds. And so as Dan says, he, he instituted this, uh, this party. He wanted to welcome me to Washington, Amy Carter, was uh, in, had just arrived with her parents, and the circus came to Washington. Uh, he said, I'm gonna have a party for you. I said, fine. He said, you gotta bring Amy Carter. Bring your parents if you can't, but it was the beginning of his term. He wasn't gonna go to the circus for sure. So got Amy there, and, and all the, my new 
friends in the Congress to come. And he had this, you know, had a reception before with showgirls and clowns and Gunnar Gable Williams and all. And my, you know, my, obviously my guests thought that was wonderful. Had the circus in the middle of the performance. He took all the children of my guests, most of them congressmen, including Amy, put them in the circus and they went around and did that. Well, wow. Well, then when it came time, then everybody started raising money for the next year later on. Uh, I kept going to these people and say, well, how, what, how do you do this? You know, <laughs> And I suddenly thought, well, I called up uh, Irvin Feldman and said, hey, can we do that again and can I charge for it? <laughs> for the next 15 years, I had a great big party at the circus and uh, it, it was my funding mechanism and, and was a, you know, people would line up before, for fear they wouldn't get a, be able to get a ticket to my operation. So funny things like that happen in, in the world. It was good. Well, let me get into this subject we really want to talk about, but I think it's fun to hear stories of uh, how things took place back in the 70s and 80s and into the 90s. But uh, this issue of partisanship is what we, I wanted to talk about some. And what Andy's opinion is, having been there, and he was a, a whip uh, within the Democratic Party. He, when he arrived, and Tip O'Neill became a friend because of the Boston Red Sox. Andy was involved in getting the Boston Red Sox to move to Winter Haven back in the early 70s, and Tip O'Neill was, of course, a big Boston Red Sox fan, so they, had a, they hit it off. So Andy was within the Democratic Party, and it was the partisanship that existed there, and I think he'll tell it in more detail than I can, was behind closed doors. I mean, I think was, you were there when Huntley Brinkley was on, probably, and Walter Cronkite were still on television, uh, and so you didn't have you know the fair and balanced news that we get out of Fox these days. Uh, but uh, fair, balanced, and blonde. Don't forget. <laughs> and blonde. That's right. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but the Democratic caucus back then uh, was about two thirds liberal Democrats and one third conservative Democrats. And so within the Democratic caucus, there was hyper-partisanship going on all the time. But that, that was behind closed doors. And so you know, when they stepped out of the room, things you know, were very calm. But within the room, it was, you know, a lot of partisanship existed. And then, then he was part of the bull wheel. So describe about the partisanship and how it was when you first got there and how it evolved, if you can, please. Well, you should know that when Dan first asked me to, to join him here, which was last fall or something, I wrote him a letter and said, and he proposed that we were going to talk about the lack of civility and everything else and, and how it, it didn't really exist. And he the only one it, it was thinking that way. All the press, academia, and everybody said, oh, Tip O'Neill and Reagan got along well and everything was lovey-dovey and whatnot. And I wrote him back and I said, I'll be, I'll be glad to know, but you got to know that uh, when you ask me a question along that line, if we have, <laughs> if it works that way, I feel quite the opposite. That uh, you know, Jefferson and uh, Madison said awfully nasty things about uh, Mr. Adams, <clears throat> got their word out, started false rumors and everything else, both going both ways. <clears throat> Many of you have seen the movie Lincoln. Uh, lack of civility was certainly alive and well then. And this period that, that, uh, that is perceived in, in high quarters that there was, you know, uh, no hostility and there was great civility during this period, in, in my view, for what it's worth, uh, are just plain wrong. In, in, now, strike, here's what it was going on. We can talk about how, it, how and why it changed, but uh, in a little bit more detail than what Dan says, he's, he's right. The, the Democrat, I was thrown in the Democrat, nice old tip, made me a whip. I didn't even know what the total, I have a general idea what a whip does, but the mechanics of it, nothing I knew. And it, so, unlike most people, I was a whip the day I walked in the door. And so it was a great learning process. Went to the closed Democratic caucus, and all of a sudden I realized that well, there's something unusual going on here. There's some harsh words going back and forth between uh, some of these younger guys and, and some of the 
old bull, so to speak. Well, here's the way it was. Like Dan says, maybe two-thirds more liberal Democrats, one-third very conservative Democrats, largely from the South, but from other parts of the, of the country, too, that were conservative. The conservative ones in the Democratic Party stayed there a long time. Because of the seniority operation, they were chairman of committees. Wright Patman, Bear, Robinson, people like that that all of you are familiar with. Very strong positions. And in those positions as chairman, uh, chairman of committees in the majority, you know, wield a, a great deal of power. So the, while they, they all voted together to elect a speaker, you know, that was the only thing they all automatically voted together when they went out from the caucus to elect a speaker. But inside that caucus, you had the, the frustrated two-thirds that knew that if they took their legislation the way they wanted it, to the floor, this other crowd, which were the powerful ones, would join up with the Republicans who were pretty uniformly conservative, and they wouldn't win. So uh, what was going on with a great deal, I'll guarantee you, lack of civility inside that caucus, no press around, no nothing at that time, they were tooth and nail between this the way the power structure inside the Democratic Party was. Everybody knew it. You know, it didn't take me long to figure it out. It wasn't, you know, you know, some great scientific discovery. But everybody understood that that's the way of the work. Okay? As soon as that little fight was off, taken care of inside, the legislation was ready. They knew they had the support of the Republicans because what the conservative Democratic leadership had done. They went out there and it rolled through. Of course, it, it began when I was, it, as I began, they started having recorded electronic votes, which before they hadn't had. So it even worked better before that. But even when those votes went up on the board, you had, everybody knew it, and everybody was lovey-dovey vis-a-vis uh, Tip O'Neill and, you know, the, the majority leader in the, in the House, uh, and just all the way up and down the line. In, in the committees, and that was what was perceived as this great civility. <clears throat> and it wasn't where, really where the action was. The action was in the Democratic caucus. They, they had far greater majority uh, than either they've had ever since it's been swapping back and forth. But uh, the procedure was, was different, and, uh, and it gave a false impression. So. Uh, that's just one man's opinion that lived through it, came there with a blank slate, and that's what I saw happening. And the minute <clears throat> uh, things transpired, uh, that uh, I'm sure Dan will uh, talk about too, uh, that that all of that changed, including going off to uh, more re more Republicans uh, being being elected in other places. One or two of us, myself, Phil Graham, such, sw switching parties and and uh, being elected, as as that took place and it all became out in the open, then then you started the public got started seeing they saw Newt Gingrich take on Jim Wright, you know things like that. They 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 see that kind of thing now, but historically, my opinion, for what it's worth, is it's been there since the beginning of our republic, we're really glad that, uh, that uh, as uh, Reagan said in his first inaugural, you know, what a great country we have, you know, economically and, and militarily, and, and we can change to a great degree the focus of our government without firing a shot. I forgot the exact words, but that's what he said in his inaugural. But, and that's true. I mean, the, the lack of civility may injure mine or yours or other people's feelings from time to time, but it sure beats what goes on in countries around the world to this very day and, uh, and getting it done. I uh, talked about briefly last time 
how, uh, I think it was George Wallace, or who, I forget who made that quote, but is it, they used to say there's not a dime's over the difference between the two parties because you had the conservative Democrats and the liberal Democrats, and you had the liberal Republicans, uh, the Rockefeller Republicans, and the uh, conservative Republicans. And nowadays we have a conservative party and a liberal party. I mean, there's just not much middle ground left. But a lot of it goes back to the 60s civil rights legislation. But the election in 74 was right before you, uh, is when a large number of Democrats got elected as post-Watergate. It was just a huge Democratic wave election in 74. And some of the members are still there. Henry Waxman was part of that group, who was the architect of the health care bill. Uh, George, George Miller was, is still there. Um, no relation, of course. No, no, no relationship. We, he, he, he lived in, uh, George Miller lived in a townhouse a couple doors from us there on D Street. And our laundry would get mixed up sometimes. I'd get his shirts, he'd get my shirts from the laundry. But, um, uh, uh, so, t you know, so things changed, I think, in that 74 and another wave, you know, when you got elected in 76, um, that just started the, the liberal wing dominating the uh, uh, Democratic Party much more than it did prior to that. And that may have been why Haley said, I don't want any more to do with it. I don't know. <laughs> so. Uh, but let, let me ask you, since we're talking about individuals, let's talk about, you served with uh, several speakers, Tip O'Neill, uh, Jim Wright, Tom Foley, um, and on the Republican side, I want you to mention also about Bob Michael and uh, Newt Gingrich, who uh, <clears throat> were in the minority back then. Talk about the different speakers you served with and how they worked things and what the relationship was between them and the, um, this issue of civility and yeah. such. Well, um, of course, you can tell by my other remarks I've made, I, I thought a lot of Tip O'Neill. We had, had a lot of in common kind of besides the, the Boston Red Sox. But, uh, I mean, after all, if it hadn't, Red Sox, kind of things that kind of made my life easier. I, one of the, there were no financial rewards to getting him to move to Winter Haven, but there was one that was far greater than that. Uh, and that was for 25 years, I got to pick the bad boys in this little town, <laughs> and my kids were growing up. So at any rate, a wonderful guy, and a guy that could, could understand uh, what was going on in this era that I described, uh, but, it, but was able to handle it as it began to change. Uh, he, he knew, uh, because he, he had been, he was one of those old bulls on the, uh, but he, <clears throat> that was successful in, in being a committee chairman and, and, and rising into the leadership, but he understood what was going on uh, that way. And as it became more open, which, uh, as I say, was the electronic voting, put it, we had more, there were like 1,300 votes in Carter's first year. It was stunning. They, before that, they had a couple hundred a year, you know, because it took a long time to called the roll and 435 names and people milling around and all that. So all of a sudden these things changed. Television came in, uh, kind of not so much of it, but all of a sudden uh, these guys that wanted to communicate, even though it was just on C-SPAN, were they couldn't wait to get over to the house floor and get on television. So he had to ride this fucking Bronco that was coming down the line. and. It, uh, he did just a really marvelous job about that. A, a difficult uh, uh, thing that happened later on is, as, you, as time went by, and Newt Gingrich uh, became a backbencher on the thing, on the Republican side. Well, uh, it, Newt started needling him. Well, people didn't do that before. <laughs> I didn't matter. Nobody needled Sam Rayburn or anybody else. And that, there were some eruptions there, and as uh, uh, we know, there was a famous thing where uh, a penalty that I knew nothing about until it came up when they uh, voted to cause uh, uh, taking down the remarks of Newt Gingrich because, and that, I mean, uh, yeah, t of Tip oh, sorry, No, was Newt, 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 uh, Newt's remarks, and, and that's as close as it got, but it was, it was it was hard, and that all, every member was f facing this change in some way or another. Tip did a good job. Jim Wright was a 
great orator. Uh, he was almost a, a, to a, a, a lot of us. Uh, I mean, almost too smooth, <laughs> you know, kind of uh, way. It, again, this personal opinion, but you had to admire him for the way he could, uh, you know, phrase an issue and 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 make it go. Of course, he he ran into problems as as an old timer there, uh, the rules on what you could do and not do changed. Uh, a lot of senior members, Bob Sykes from Florida, Ross Dinkowski, Jim Wright, you know, you get, they got busy and didn't pay attention to the details. And of course, in politics, those are the things people jump on. And then, uh, and, and again, Newt Gingrich uh, was the antagonist in the Republican Party. And, and got after him, caused Jim to lose his speakership. Uh, Foley uh, was very competent. He was, uh, had been chairman of the Agricultural Committee and whatnot. Uh, he uh, he just kind of seemed to ride it out. Um, and then, of course, uh, when he lost his election, which was an unusual thing for a sitting speaker to be. Uh, defeated in his home district, and that was as as the worm turned, so to speak, uh, and as the Republicans, because of the this openness and and the changing and and uh, the liberal conservative label being out for everybody to see and not hidden as it was before. Uh, and uh, but, I mean, he, he was like, it. I was there with Tom Foley. He got he was Speaker of the House. He got defeated in the '94 election, which was a Republican wave election, and he represented Spokane, Washington. And the one issue that defeated him was guns, the assault weapons vote, for the for only time in history that a Speaker of the House was defeated for re-election was 1994. But he was w representing the uh, eastern part of Washington State, and the gun issue defeated him. So we, we've talked about the gun issue coming up again. That's the reason politicians, Republicans and Democrats, are walking uh, you know, carefully on that issue. That's a good point, absolutely. But talk about also Bob Michael uh, and then how Newt rose into power too, please. Well, uh, Bob Michael, of course, minority leader his whole time. And uh, he uh, was very popular and he, he was a product of that syndrome that I've described going on. He was, uh, even before he, w when he was the Republican whip, when Mr. Rhodes was the Republican minority leader, but Bob Michael was involved in the understanding of what was going on and, so to speak, marshaled the, marshaled the troops during this scenario that was going on, that every, and it, which is obviously what made uh, made it look like it was so civil. And there couldn't have been a more civil guy than Bob Michael. He's just a wonderful guy. He's uh, just got an invitation to his 90th birthday yesterday. Uh, he, he, but um, he, he, he had to be going with the flow. It was changing. And, uh, and it, uh, the issues in, in the old way of doing it wasn't there any longer. And he was going to Blowed by at which time uh, uh, Newt Gingrich, who was, uh, it kind of came in the Congress right after I did, had been outspoken and spoken and, and was, even before he had any uh, name leadership post, he was on his feet uh, when, as, it, as really everything was out in the open. And uh, uh, he and uh, a couple others, like Bob Walker and all, were kind of working together. And so Newt, when the time came, he's the one that instigated, as you recall, the contract with America, the, the election right after your election, your second election. Uh, and, and because he had that leadership, as soon as they, they won in 94, uh, the Republicans won, I mean, he was, there wasn't any question who was going to be speaker, uh, unless you knew something that I didn't. But, uh, so Newt was, uh, you know, interesting. I know when I did change parties, which is a whole another story of how that happened, but uh, 
Newt came up to me. Of course, I knew him. We were in the same chamber all the time, but I didn't know him very well. He said, I want you to, now that you're a Republican, I want you to join the COS. And I said, what is the COS? He says, the Conservative Opportunity Society. Oh, I said, what's that? He said, it, it's, uh, it's it, it counterbalance to the liberal welfare state. <laughs> and he said, can you come to the meetings? And I said, sure. When do they happen? He said, well, we have them in people's offices. Um, and the next one's going to be in uh, Connie Mack's office or whatever it is. So I went there. There was Connie Mack and Newt and me and Bob Walker. One of the, there were five of us there. I said, is this it? <laughs> he said, oh, yeah, but we're, we're, we're just starting it out. We're building it. Well, within 10 months, it had gone from, well, we got kind of a full house in this office. Then we had to get a special room. And, but, you know, within a year, he had a call, practically a caucus of the whole Democratic delegation in Congress there. And, and that's the kind of way that he operated and what he built it at. Back when Bob Michael was a minority leader, my sense was there was an acceptance of being the permanent minority, that the majority, that in the House in particular, because of a powerful rules committee, uh, they can have real control over um, uh, what, what takes place. So the minority has a very limited role. You want me to pause or? Uh, there is, the minority has a limited role because it's totally controlled by the majority. And the Republicans for a long time just had this permanent minority mindset. And things have changed. And today now, the, the, I like to say the goal of the minority is to be the majority. If, when the Republicans are in the minority, their goal is to be the majority. Right now, the Democrats are in the minority in the House, and their goal is to be the majority. And so if your goal is to be the majority, cooperation is not part of the, the right. system. And that's part of what's changed things is Absolutely. the Republicans were accepting of the minority position, and Bob Michael was a good advocate of that. And Newt said, we, we're, we're meaningless in the minority. And so Newt kind of took the bull by the horns back in the, before I got there and uh, said, well, we want to be in the majority. That, that's a, a really good analysis because it, and it's, you can see the depth of it. That had been going on for 30, 40 years, you know, uh, and, and maybe before. The, this out of, out of sight, out of mind, working out things so it was all. But all the Republicans, whether they were ranking members on committees uh, and had these per various perks, it all depended on that system. And there wasn't, wasn't anybody or any reason to buck the system. They couldn't see how they would get any better because they would, they would have a good rapport from the Dem with the Democratic chairman of the committee they were on and who was, <laughs> those were the real power people. And they were handing out goodies on both sides of the aisle as far as prestige and leadership and all that kind of thing. So it, it was, and Bob was certainly, he'd be the first one to tell you he was comfortable in that. And that's, he, he grew up on a, but then the system changed right out from under him. You know. There's a saying, I forget who made the quote, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And I think the Democrats had control of the House for 40 years and it ended in 94 election. Uh, and towards the end of that 40 years, that's when Jim Wright got into legal troubles and such. Uh, and it happens to both parties. When Republicans had control from 90, <coughs> after 94, and then uh, you had the Duke Cunninghams, who's in federal prison, and Tom DeLay, that you, when you're in the majority, you have this absolute power, and there's, there's a little corrupting effect of that. And so I, I think it's good that power changes from one party to the other party, because when I got there in 90. Two, um, the Democrats have been there in charge, and you felt meaningless there. And that's a great frustration of being in the minority, and that's one reason the minorities always wanted to be in the majority. Right. Well, it, along that same line, I, uh, it, it, there was enough beginning that when I switched parties in 84, I, the countless people said, you're going from, you know, from the majority party to the minority party. And I said, well, you know, that, that's the way it would have to be because I was already a subcommittee chairman and was in line for a committee chairmanship and all that kind of business. But that, too, was getting washed away. And it's just part of what you say, the, the, the dynamics change. 
Let me add, talk a little bit about campaigns and elections a little bit from 1976 until we see today, and this talks about the money issue in politics. Um, it, it's, uh, we, we, everybody hates the money part of politics, and it's gotten worse, but because it's a First Amendment issue, it's not going to change. Bottom line is the Supreme Court's ruled money is free speech, so it's really hard to kind of control the money issue. Uh, and you know, I found that interesting story about getting a $25 check from Jim Haley, <laughs> which, uh, uh, you know, nowadays you, you, people raise millions of dollars. But, and nowadays, when you get elected to Congress, Republican or Democrat, your goal in six months is to have $500,000 in your campaign account. That's the goal that a freshman Republican or a freshman Democrat has right now and told by their parties to get a half million dollars in your, in your campaign account. I mean, we didn't spend that for an entire career even. I mean, <laughs> what was your campaign like in 76 and the money? I mean, you never really had a tough election. Maybe in 84 was you had Pat Glass, um, a, a, a very capable person, but right. you know, it was uh, a Republican district by then. Even that didn't get up in the million dollar category. No. <laughs> it was, it, it, was, uh, it, 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 was, it was quite, quite different. Uh, and as it, as it pressure got on, you got people from outside the district coming in to, you know, to do that. Uh, and uh, it, I was blessed and I, I would always tell people, I, I made the mistake one time of somebody was asking, well, how do you like go, having to go back and forth all the time? And I said, well, I get to go back to Florida. This was early in the game. Uh, the weather's good and everything else. And, and so I said, I wouldn't do this if I had to go back and forth to Minnesota and I didn't notice that this guy Overstar was sitting back I mean he was from Duluth Minnesota <laughs> he, he didn't like that worth a damn yeah <laughs> but it um, you know it's the and I was blessed by I didn't have a, an opponent uh, in my second and third my, my you know up until when I switched I didn't have an opponent and which meant that uh, strangely enough you're not on the ballot in Florida, or at least then you weren't, if you didn't have an opponent. So if, if I tried to raise money, somebody would say, well, you don't have an opponent, what are you doing? You know? Of course, that didn't work out too well for me when I decided I would switch parties because I realized that I hadn't been on the ballot you know, for all those years, and it was like starting over. But, uh, but that's an unusual thing, and, I, and I've always had a great respect for the and there were plenty of them. There are even more now. The, somebody that runs for office, elections November 4th or November 5th, somebody announces that they're running against him in two years. Now that'll, that'll give you pause for concern. Yeah, <laughs> nowadays it's millions of dollars. And, yeah. and for most of us, when I got elected in 92, I didn't really have any tough reelections. This area is fairly Republican. Uh, and I raised some money and I had to be prepared for a campaign. But what happens is all the money pours into these other races. I mean, like we have a real good mutual friend, Clay Shaw from Fort Lauderdale. He got defeated in the Democratic wave of 2006. Nothing he did wrong. He was a good congressperson for the Fort Lauderdale area. But um, I mean, that race was over $10 million because all the money, they didn't put money into this area because I didn't have opponents much. Uh, and, but the money would go into these competitive races, which is only a handful of races out of the whole 435. And so the money is obscene, we agree. I, but I, you know, I, do you have any idea how to control it? I mean, it's no, a First I, Amendment issue. No, we just have to deal with it the way it is. I think it's interesting enough, and, and we can talk a lot about the perception that you see in the press, not only like civility, but in, in this, in this uh, regard, is that, um, you know, the, the perception as our president right now uh, uh, gets a lot of ink from, I don't blame him for saying it or anything else, that, okay, you know, I won, you know, get used to it, you know, I won 51%, which is actually lower than most people <laughs> that won in second term. But, and, and Congress's rating is 9% or 10%. Well, wait a minute, in that election, everybody elected to Congress got at least 50% plus one vote, <laughs> you know. Most of them got 70, 80, 60 percent. Uh, some of them probably didn't have an opponent. Not too much of that goes on anymore. But by definition, those people, all 435 of them, 
who are elected by a majority of the people in the area that they represent. And that's hardly a bad reputation. Now, and I've served with Chuck Schumer, I mean, very aggressive liberal Democrat, now in the Senate, of course. And his locker was next to mine in the gym and everything. And I mean, he's a fun guy to be around and, and an intense guy. For his, we didn't agree on a lot of things. But uh, Schumer was, uh, I, I couldn't begrudge what, what he was uh, saying. And then he didn't begrudge what I was doing. And it, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's a whole uh, different, different ball game, you know. And it uh, doesn't say who's right or who's wrong. It's what makes America go, you know. That. Let me talk about, you served with three presidents, uh, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, and George H.W. Bush. And my understanding is the relationship between the president and Congress has changed. When I served, I served with Bill Clinton and George W. Bush for two years, uh, first two years of George Bush, W. Bush's uh, presidency. Um, back, I think, especially in Reagan years, the president had a close interaction with Congress. Uh, I don't think that takes place today with Obama. I don't think it took place really a lot with George W. Bush or even with Bill Clinton. You had a social interaction at an event or such. But uh, talk about the, Jimmy Carter and then Reagan in particular, how you, you, know, you went down to the White House on a regular basis with uh, uh, Reagan is my understanding. Yeah, well, I, I did, of course, because of that. And Carter, when I went there, uh, it was, there was great frustration among my senior colleagues in the House uh, with Mr. Carter, although they're the same party and everything, because in their, in their view, probably oversimplified, Mr. Carter didn't, uh, it, this guy doesn't understand what makes this place work, you know, and uh, it was a matter of, uh, he didn't understand what their needs were in the, in the Congress, didn't, uh, you know, I remember early in the game going, I was on the International Relations Committee, thank you, Mr. O'Neill, uh, and, and I got called to do some, a lot of things, again, because of that, and I, I went down, and Carter, just early on, maybe in the first six months I was there, Carter had gone to an international economic conference and was coming back to report, and he got the speaker, and the speaker got maybe 25 members, including me, nicely enough, down to the White House for breakfast and whatnot. So they had a little breakfast, and Carter gets up and he talks about all these things uh, that uh, were, were going, going on. And, I mean, what a window on, on the world of what was going on. And I was walking down, and I got this slap on the back, and it was O'Neill, and we were moving to have some more refreshments, and he said, Hey, how about that, Andy? Isn't that a lot more fun than the banking business? And I said, well, hey, you got that, you know. And, but the, the in, intriguing thing was that uh, while that was going on, Carter didn't have a, a, the feel of it. Now, a, a meeting like that with Reagan, my goodness, everybody was a lot of interchange and everything else. And it was a, a definite personality uh, uh, operation. Uh, there, the, and I, I think if you go through our presidents, what we know, and you know, in some detail more about the Washingtons and the Polks, you know, things like that, that has a great bearing on the relationship. Uh, and then the relationships, of course, with the Congress, you uh, go through the leadership and the speakers, and uh, and and that's it, there's a, a lot to be looked at. Uh, with those personalities. Uh, Bill Clinton, I wasn't uh, admittedly on, on his side on a lot of issues, but I got talked into going to a, by a young, yeah, this was after I'd left the Congress, of course, by a young man, uh, Nick Rahal, who was from West Virginia, had come to the Congress when I did, and he said, you gotta come, you know, see Mr. Clinton. I'm having my birthday party, big, shebang down here and upstairs we're going to have a, a special lunch and he's going to come and I want you to be up there. There are only 25 of us. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't agree with this guy. So he badgered me into doing it. And I have to say that when Clinton uh, arrived 
for the little thing we were doing. We were sitting in tables, maybe maybe the same a number as you out here. Um, he stopped at the door and he started talking. He said he gave a few words and remarks and and it was incredible because I knew most of these people. They weren't people in Congress. Some of them lobbyists and some of them old friends of this guy. And I just got to think. Now he s said something, including me, in there that I feel strongly about, and I agree with him. You know, <laughs> all the way, without naming the people, he went through there, and then he said, uh, "Well, he said now I want to uh, just take a time and come by each of your tables and sit and talk for a little while." And I poked my host and I said, "I'm out of here. He's got my wallet and everything else." You know? <laughs> I mean, he was really good. You got to give him that. So those, that personality, in those relationships, they get all the limelight uh, forced on them, rightly or wrongly, and and they all react differently. And it's, a, it's, it's but my impression, thing. Reagan is re was really the master of this. Oh yeah. I mean, that uh, I mean, I've never never met Reagan. I heard him give a talk one time, yeah. but uh, well, the, my when Reagan came to the Congress. I was obviously a Democrat, but I joined up with, again, this whip organization, but there were people, most many of you know, uh, Phil Graham from Texas, and uh, Stan Holm from uh, Texas, uh, uh, Sonny Montgomery from Mississippi, guy from Alabama, Stump from Arizona. And we had about nine of us that ultimately called us bowl weevils and things like that. But but I guess uh, as it grew, maybe they, we got up to 15 or so. But we would, we were all either in the WIP organization or had done that kind of thing, and we would meet once or twice a week, uh, going over. You remember, Reagan wanted to have his tax things passed and and that type of thing, and we uh, all joined together and we would raise votes sometimes. 25, sometimes 30, one or two times up in the 60s. Votes of, because we were playing it the other way. This, we were working over, oh, the old bulls weren't doing it in the Democratic Party because they were being, I mean, that era was moving out, but there were a, a, still quite a few conservatives in the Democratic Party, and we knew them, were personal friends with them, and we worked on that thing. And so, uh, because of that, we were in and out of the White House uh, a, a good bit, and uh, and it was uh, it was an interesting time. I, I told Dan that I the, the one <laughs> one White House state dinner I went to uh, with Nancy and I uh, was uh, uh, for Gandhi, who was the uh, the uh, Prime Minister of the of uh, uh, India at the time, and uh, my wife, uh, as Glenda knows back there, you know, hasn't really forgiven me yet because I wasn't able to go because one of these votes was coming up. So she had to wing it herself, and I came in, you know, just after the salad or something like that. And uh, and and Reagan, I mean, he was just old shoe. He banged on the thing, made everybody be quiet, got up and said. He, of course, he knew what the vote was, so somebody passed him a note. He said, Andy, how about telling them what happened in the House? But it was all that kind of thing that Reagan was always doing. And I guess I've uh, told Dan more times than he wants to hear about when I decided to switch parties, um, uh, because I, you know, I was, had been doing all this, I uh, was out. And Jim Baker happened to be a friend from school days and whatnot. And I went up to uh, Jim at a cocktail party and said, "Look, I haven't told anybody, but I'm going to switch parties, and uh, and I, I I want Reagan to know about it ahead of time, so you know, whatever blip comes up about it, you know, he's comfortable with it." But I said, and I I, I sure like his support, but people in my district don't even want to. They love Ronald Reagan, but they don't want him to tell them how to vote. And he said, well, I understand you, whatnot. And I got up to go out, and I always, because of this bull weevil business, I'd been going out, I started going back out the door. He said, no, come here. We walked in and, and surprised Reagan at his desk. Now, here the press was saying, well, 
this guy's old, he hadn't got it together, and all that kind of thing. Baker says, hey, our bold evil friend Ireland's going to change parties. And he looked at me and he said, do you remember what Winston Churchill said? And I could remember, you know, we will fight on the lands and on the beaches. I knew that wasn't it. I said, no, Mr. President, I don't know. He proceeded, quote, word for word, the last two stanzas of a speech that Churchill gave on the floor of the House of Commons years before when Churchill switched parties. Of course, you know that. And it ended by Churchill saying, you know, some people change their principles to suit their party. I prefer to change my party, you know, to suit my principles. Well, what do you think turned up on my literature after that, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, it was, it was, the guy was remarkable. And I'm not taking anything from any of the others. He just had that ability to, to articulate, stick to his principles, and not offend people. And, and that, that's pretty hard to do. We all know people like that, uh, but it's, it, it's in that crucible, it's hard to do. Let me ask one more question, then I'm gonna open up the questions yeah. from the uh, people here in the room. Um, I, I was wanting to ask you about George H.W. Bush, but we, let's, let me switch to this one. And you mentioned about the personal side of Congress, and we hear about this, uh, how nowadays Congress is basically <laughs> in session from Tuesday to Thursday. It's only there, people fly in on Tuesday, 50, 60 members sleep in their offices on an inflatable bed and go down to the gym and clean up. And that's the lifestyle of Congress. Very few people move their families to Washington. Back when you first got there, it was a different issue. Transportation was not as easy as, you know, right now there's lots of flights between Tampa and um, Washington and such. Uh, and, there, but the, and so there's less personal interaction. When you're only there for 48 hours, you're very busy. And on Tuesday, Thursday evenings, there are lots of events, and so you have a calendar for, full of all kinds of receptions and functions to go to. Um, talk about what it was like in the 70s and 80s in particular, because it, people interacted socially a lot more because more people spent time in Washington. Yeah, uh, uh, you're exactly right, but it was, if you know, looking back on it, the ones that did spend time there were the ones that had come up years before with the transportation situation as it was and done it as these beginning with the Watergate years uh, the first thing they started telling each other is okay if we're going to do this you got to go back to your district every week um, and uh, so it got started and started changing and so it, it, I mean it didn't change overnight uh, our good friend Lee Hamilton who had lived his life in Washington and going back every once in a while you know to visit his district and raised his family in Washington. And that, that he, he continued to do that, but the others, uh, the younger ones coming from Indiana, you know, were then uh, were going back and forth. So it, I mean, it's a, it's a dynamic and yes, people got to know each other better. That's a real plus, lost in this kind of shuffle because it's hard to, hard to do that when you're going back and forth. At the same time, uh, you, if you are the ones that stay in in the, in Washington in the district in the District of Columbia all that time, you're perhaps losing touch with what the people say think in your district. Uh, now may improve by email and everything, but that was the day of you know snail mail and whatnot. <laughs> uh, so you, you lose out on one, but the other your responsibility is you're supposed to be representing those people uh, and it and also uh, bringing I always would say that the job is to not only represent what the people say but the people in your district have got jobs and children to take care of and everything else and you're up there on their behalf 100% and it's up to you to find out about this stuff and bring the news of it at least your take of the news of it back down to the district so you know, you you get good and bad on both ends of the deal, right? and it's 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 that part isn't easy. And it, again, if you have to go back and forth to California, that's a bear. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, George Miller lived down the street from me, and Nancy Pelosi, she'd fly home every week. I mean, yeah. they just did not spend. I mean, they're just their lifestyle and such, yeah. which is hard for the people on the West Coast because that three-hour time zone changes. Yeah. You know, for those of us on the East Coast, it's much easier. The people that live on the West Coast, they would always stay on West Coast time. 
uh, so that they, uh, uh, they hated early morning meetings, but they didn't mind midnight things because that was their lifestyle. But uh, with that, let me open up for questions. And there's a microphone there. If you can get to the microphone, if you can't, I will repeat the question. Dick, you want to go to the microphone, please? Thank you very much for coming here today from Boca Grande. It's such a beautiful place, and uh, we all enjoy going down there and have fish tarpon and, and spent time on USEP at parties and other things. It's, and we have common friends that have done that. Um, my question is this. As I look at each of you, I would describe you as calm, cool, collected, there's not virtually a furrow in your brows. Dan is a little grayer than he was. But other than that, you know, you, you seem um, sanguine about the situation, the political situation, the direction our country is going, or at least I read that in you. Um, I'm nervous. I'm right of center. I'm not a lunatic right. Um, I have more than one friend who's a John Bircher, and he describes everything that's going on in Washington as treason. I don't think it's quite that bad, <laughs> but I'm scared. Um, I see um, uh, an executive branch that is taking more and more um, authority. I hear statements like maybe the Constitution is irrelevant. Um, there are statements like debt and deficit are also irrelevant, that somehow a government can borrow forever and it doesn't play by the same rules. Um, I have trouble at times sleeping at nights trying to solve these problems, <laughs> and uh, that's obviously uh, not in my job description, but I think about them a lot, and I utter ugly words at the TV from time to time, and yet we all see the same reality, filtered to some degree, but the same reality. So having said that, help me understand how I can enjoy the next 50 years of my life <laughs> without having to worry about the direction that our country is going and whether or not the great experiment that began in 1786, uh, whether or not that will survive. Um, well, I, let, 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 me, let me say, I'm, I'm like the duck, I'm calm and serene on the surface, but I'm paddling like hell underneath. <laughs> uh, I'm going to try after this experience to talk Dan into, you know, he writes well and everything. I went to Yale Engineering School so I wouldn't have to write a thesis. But it uh, joined me in writing a book and I thought I'd call it uh, uh, The First Emperor of the United States of America or The Death of Regular Order. We can discuss that some more. The, I'm, I'm concerned like you are, I have to say that. Uh, the nature of you know, we're, we're talking about feelings over history up to now. Uh, I, I, I too am, am concerned. I, it, uh, it baffles me w that uh, we can <clears throat> make our decision on, not, not that some of these social issues aren't, aren't important, uh, and we all have personal experiences that make those important, but uh, that but it baffles me with the seriousness of what we've got going on economically, you described it, uh, as well as, and I served on the armed services and the intelligence committee, so I, what goes on in, our, in the military area uh, in these hot spots in the world is, is, affects me quite a bit. Uh, and I'm, I, I, I am concerned, and I, I think about it a lot. Uh, the, uh, the, the what, what can we do? Uh, it, it seems to me we, we've got to, got to somewhere, somewhere we've got to get that out. What I would consider, and I, some of, the, some of the basics, you know, if you increase government spending, you get dependency. If you increase private investment and in spending, you get more jobs in a positive, I mean, the track record is there. You know, I, I mean, it was, a, it, Kennedy did it, <laughs> you know, people done it all along. So throw all those things in there and uh, chalk me up as agreeing with you. I'm very concerned about our situation at the present time. Just, my, just a brief answer, comment was, I mean, I, I'm concerned too, but 
you know, I'd like to avoid looking at the details sometimes of how Washington functions. It's kind of scary and messy. But long term, the future is still going to work out. Most of us have seen the movie Lincoln. I mean, it was, and it was nothing worse in our history than that period in the 1860s. So, you know, there's a pendulum in politics. Uh, after 1974 re-election, people thought the Republican Party was gone for forever. I mean, it was not many of them even left in Congress. It came back in the 80s. Uh, the Democrats had a great surge of power there for a while. Republicans came back into power in 94. The Democrats came back into power in 2006. Now we have a divided government. And so, um, you know, it's a pendulum that may go back and forth. And the, I still think, as this one article I'm handing out today by Robert Samuelson, we feel good about things. I mean, in a way, you've still got to feel good about the country. It's, it's dramatically different. I mean, our, you know, we didn't have cell phones and GPSs and uh, all the things that they have today on the internet. Uh, and so the, the world, the government's got to change too. So I'm a little more optimistic. Let me go to another question. Yes, former Assistant Secretary of Energy uh, back in the Reagan years. Thanks. I'm Dave Rossin. Uh, I have a book at home about this thick. It's called The Power Game, How Washington Works by Hedrick Smith, who covered Washington for the New York Times for a decade or more. You, neither of you today mentioned the staff. And I would say half of that big, thick book is the congressional staff. And I wonder if you would make some comments on that. I'd be glad to. Um, the, uh, and you should know that we shared uh, one particular staff member who uh, uh, was very good, uh, that the staff is vitally important in the process, as that, as that book points out. I can remember faced early, maybe in my first year, with a question of, okay, what is the, the, this lady wanted to know, what was all these nasty old lobbyists out there and, and people that had influence on legislation, uh, we ought to curtail them. And I thought, you know, I don't want to get in the morass of debating this, you know, I, I don't want to avoid it. But, but I said, well, when you think about it, um, the, what, instead of putting limits on all these other things, the, what really is al already a concern of mine is uh, that the staffs on these committees, for instance, stay there, as you well know, year after year, committee chairmen come and go, and things are getting so complicated that you have a, a this is on the, on the kind of negative side, that, that, that staff perpetuates things and, and doesn't, doesn't move the way and, and address the future and everything as it should. On the other hand, uh, the staff uh, uh, in personal offices, the staff uh, on the other side of the staff and the committees is, is really good. You have bright people, often, often young, yes, but they're charged up, they have the information, they work hard. Uh, and all in all, I think they generally reflect uh, what the congressman or the senator wants to happen, uh, it has all the drawbacks of excess bureaucracy. Um, I was blessed by, uh, I had, when I switched parties, the, uh, by a chief of staff, a woman that, uh, when I switched parties, George Will wrote an article and said, well, you know, it was entitled, you know, a Democrat quietly leaves the party. <laughs> And there wasn't a whole lot of fan for it. Well, it was down here, but not up here. And uh, he described, said, I got an orange juice machine in my office. Uh, and I did. Obviously, I was in the orange juice business uh, in, in the center of the state. And then he said, and, his, um, and he's a preppy from Andover and Yale, which was, a thing. but then he said, well, and he has this wonderful chief of staff who's a direct descendant of the great troublemaker from the South, J.C. Calhoun. And Miss Calhoun was a wonder. I mean, she was bright and, and just is, went on to do a great thing. So that staff is a big integral part of it. And your, your point, I, I believe, is that it, it, it is a big part of what goes on. And uh, staff is very critical. We, we all we rely on it. Um, I, I'm going up to Washington just see my son this weekend. On Monday, I'm going to have 
email, I was having lunch with my former staff uh, director in Washington, in LD, who is the health care policy person on the Ways and Means Committee. But he worked for me back in the 90s doing health care for me, and now he does it for Ways and Means. Now he's, you know, an integral part. You never would meet him or know him or anything, but he's a very bright guy. But that's the type of people that stay. Surprisingly, staff doesn't turn over that much. Even when Republicans took over in 94, a lot of the staff the Democrats had for years were kept on. This oh, is, excuse, let, me, let me say something that might relate to a lot of you in, with business backgrounds and such in the audience. One really thing that drew me up short was, you know, I, in the banking business, I was used to the, the pyramid of organization. You know, you had a couple of three vice presidents and they did so and so and everything reported up the line. And I got busy, started organizing my staff around that thing. And I was getting nowhere fast. You know, I, I couldn't understand why there was, there were young people moving from office to office and this, that, and the other thing. And I mentioned it to, to Jim Baker one night out and I said, this is, you know, I'd been at it for a year and a half. I said, this isn't working out right. What, what goes on? He said, you've got your staff, you're trying to organize like you would in business as a pyramid. You've got to organize your staff like a, the hub of a wheel and be the staff around that all, in a, and it was, in, in no time at all, I, I changed it, but that is, the, there's some, you know, dynamics of how the staff, but it makes them work better in some places and not in others, and I learned a lesson in a hurry. It was interesting. Great. Greg Porges, a um, couple of things that, uh, uh, how you see them affecting the legislative process uh, as it exists in Washington. One was, at the beginning of the Obama administration, I think it was Mitch McConnell who said that the primary purpose or the primary effort of the Republican minority is, was going to be to make sure that Obama was a one-term president. Um, and then the other thing is the, the people who made the pledges to Grover Norquist that I will never vote for taxes. Um, it, it seems to me that both the, the McConnell's statement and those who pledged never to vote for new taxes cannot be effective legislators in the sense of what's their mission. Um, not to see Obama reelected or to at all costs never vote for a new tax. And, and, and how can you legislate doing that? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the pledges have gotten a little bit out of control and I'm glad they've had this uh, thing with Grover because I, well, I, I assumed I signed it at one time, but people are saying it doesn't last the entire time. But people, you, you stand up and say, I said I was only served 10 years. I didn't sign any document to say I wasn't going to do it. I said 10 years and you leave. So you want to stand on some principles, so I don't have a problem with it, but you've got to have some flexibility if you're going to compromise. George H.W. Bush lost because in, the 1980, in, the, in 1988 he said, read my lips, no new taxes, and he compromised. So he lost his election. So if you're going to make a commitment, you've got to decide are you going to stick with it and you're going to get reelected or how it's going to work. And it's going to be interesting how this whole fiscal cliff works out the rest of this year. Uh, Mc, you know, McDonnell, um, uh, you know, I, I'm sure every Republican wants to have a you know, Republican elected president in 2016. And every Democrat wants a Democrat to be elected president uh, in 2016. So I, I think a lot was made of that. I don't think it's, as I said before, the goal of the minority is to become the majority. And whether it's in the House of Representatives, what have you, both parties have that as a goal. Yeah. I, th I think that's the, the, the key, what you said, which, which is a big change. I mean, as you pointed out, uh, but it, some, something about it, uh, if you're going to do that, and, and now as we say that's out, that same McConnell statement uh, like that in, in the uh, Democratic caucus in the late 70s and early 80s, nobody had ever heard of it. You know, it just wasn't. But now it's a world of everything from that to all the way through Facebook and everything else, and it's out there. The thing that really concerns me is the Democrats are making statements like that all the time. I mean, at, at liberal, both sides are making statements like that. And what, what worries me, I don't know what the answer is, but the Republicans 
have an uncanny ability to have statements like that stick. I mean, that, that statement's four years old, We're getting into its fifth year, and boy, it's in the press all the time. Uh, you know, there are a couple of blips that, uh, uh, what, what about the statement that Obama made to the plumber? Remember that? Remember that saying that, what, how was it? Uh, oh, yeah, dis distribution of wealth. It was, well, you know, you, you never hear about that anymore, you know? <laughs> and that, rightly or wrong, I'm not taking, saying, uh, you know, about the position about it or anything, is the Republicans haven't kept up in, in the communication end of some of the things they think of and, and you know, what it is, but that too will change. Yes, um, I, Davis Graham, I work at Manatee Diagnostic Center in MRI and I also worked up in Washington for seven years at the Florida House and um, I want to talk about participation and something you all talked about today where um, one person was stuck in the old ways and lost the Speaker of the House position because the next person came in and knew the new rules and worked off the new rules. I think that's kind of what we see now. I mean, we were uh, a lot of conservatives were stuck in the old way, not about social media and um, participation. Um, to me, when I worked there, and I know you all, I, people would come and talk to me about what you all were doing, and I said, well, did you tell them that? Did you invite them into your, to your facility while they were at home? Did you show them the problems that are, are going on? My question, I mean, uh, I think the social media really took hold of this past election. I mean, I, I, it, was, it was obvious, um, and I think you all just spoke on that. What has the old way gone away, or can we bring some of the characteristics of the old way, which is really communicating with you? We can't just elect you and send you up there. I'm talking to the new Congress. Is it important for us to continue to elect them, or if we didn't elect them, still participate in um, putting our input as to what's going on in our, in our home bases or in our businesses? Or? Well, you know, as I said before, I, I would, my idea of the whole operation was that my constituents are out there doing their daily thing. They got crises and personal things, and, and I, I need to reflect what they need and want, but I also need to carry the message back. Um, I can, one, there are two, a couple of formative things that, uh, that stand out to me and what I did for no other reason, just me, but I'll share them, is that when I went there, Mr. Carter was elected. He said he was going to save Social Security. And the whole first and, and night sessions, it went all night long, and I, we talked about Social Security till we're blue in the face. And it came down to December, and it was coming to a vote. He had this plan. And uh, town meetings, I was getting into having town meetings, uh, had a couple when I would go home. And I had one scheduled for Manatee County in this auditorium on December 19th. And the vote on Carter's uh, Social Security saving was just by luck of the fly. You know, nobody knew when it was going to be, but it happened to be, you know, the 18th. Okay, the 18th in the morning, I get on the plane to come back. We've got several hundred people coming to this, it turned out, coming to this thing. And, of course, the paper reported that, that this measure that Carter had worked so hard on had passed, but they also reported that the new congressman had voted against it. One of, you know, 15 or 20 people, I forget how many it was, not a very many of us, voted against it. And uh, I walked out on the stage, I, you know, well, this is it. What are they, are they going to throw things that hurt or are they going to throw soft things or, you know, once again, and here I am, meet your new one-term congressman, you know. And I walked out on that stage and uh, 
Manatee County at that time was like rank one or two as a proportion of the population in a county in America, the highest proportion of people that were already taking, getting Social Security checks. Not a great scenario. And I didn't know, you know, I wasn't, this was, wasn't a Harry Truman, you know, holding up Dewey wins. It wasn't like that, but all the earmarks of it were. And I, I got, I just, I said, well, you know, what can I do? And I stood up and I said, well, I know that you've read the news, the Carter's bill passed, just started out there. I didn't say even who I was, I don't think. You know? <laughs> and, I, and I said, I, I want you to know, uh, it, it acknowledge to you that I know you know that I voted against it. But one, two, three things I said, I, I don't think it works, it won't work, and our children and grandchildren are going to pay the price. Well, what, it seemed like an hour went by. Uh, I had sweaty palms, you know. At any rate, one guy stood up in the middle of the thing. I didn't know whether he was going to throw something or what. He started to clap. The whole audience stood up and clapped. I think that had an impact on me. It did. No, that was, uh, and so that relationship, reaching out to the public, to let them know why is just so essential, as well as getting their input. I mean, you hit the nail on the head, yeah. Um, I think our time has reached, uh, do we have time? Can we, we can take one more question. I know the class is technically over. Let's have one quick question and. Uh, well, okay, I'll, I'll make it real brief. Uh, last uh, Thursday, I attended a seminar up in, uh, uh, well, actually it was in Las Vegas for our National Association meeting of the Home Builders, and Charlie Cook was a speaker. And good guy. <laughs> of course, the Republicans, so you kind of know where that went. But uh, spoke for an hour, and mostly your first meeting, because I missed last meeting, was basically his talk. So he really agrees with you. And he made a comment about Obama that he said, in his opinion, he is the least working with the House of Representatives. He has no use for the House, absolutely. He said, Democrat or Republican. He just does not have any use to talk to either side of the party. As far as he's concerned, they don't exist. Uh, how do you run a government like that? Um, yeah. We've talked well, about that. Ago. That's why we should run this, write this book about the, <laughs> the, the first emperor. Uh, he, he doesn't. Uh, Woodward's book points that out. Uh, it, uh, I don't know how, how it can do. It just, uh, it's the nature of his personality. and, and and that's it, huh? It's, you, you hit the nail on the head. Yeah, yeah Charlie Cook. Charlie Cook hit the nail. Yeah, Charlie Cook uh, is a nonpartisan person. I mean, he's highly respected political analyst, uh, pollster, uh, and uh, so I mean, so it's, it's well known in Washington. It's not, you know, Obama doesn't really communicate much with the Democrats there either. So I mean, that's just his presidential governing style. That's kind of the way it is. Well, with that, this is a little different class format to have an interview because of the TV cameras, but we thank Charles Clapsaddle and METV for covering this, and uh, glad to have it. And Andy, thank you for coming up and being here. It's always have, nice to have my friend. <laughs> Good job. Good job. Thank you. <laughs>